Hello everyone, welcome back to a new Stata video tutorial. My name is Juan and today I'm going to be talking about band models. I would like to let you know that there is a video number one where I show you how to estimate bar models and do some other diagnostic tests. And in this video, I'm going to be teaching you how to display the impulse response functions and the variance decomposition. And I'm also going to be talking about the Koleski decomposition. So there is a link in the description of the video where you can download the data set to replicate all the content. There's also a link where you can buy the do file in case that you would like to. I have very detailed instructions in the whole do file where you can have access to all the codes and some additional codes where you will be able to graph, um, you know, the, the graphic in, in a very professional uh, format. So let's begin then with this tutorial. Let's move now into the impulse response functions. So in our first video, we have estimated the model. We have our bar model working. So now I would like to display the impulse response functions. So what, are, what is an impulse response function? Well, impulse response function, commonly abbreviated as IRF, allow us to trace out the time path, current and future values of the variables in our model to a one unit increase in the current value of one of the bar errors. So in other words, what we are asking is what is the effect of a one unit shocking X on Y? In order to identify the impulse responses, a restriction is applied in the main matrix. Commonly, this is the Koleski decomposition, where the order of the variables play a key role, as the restrictions on the matrix implies that some shocks have no contemporaneous effects on some of the variables in the system. The order is established by the econometrician, however, economic theory and sensible assumptions are required to order the variables. Let's move now to talk a little bit about the Koleski decomposition and how to order the variables. Remember that in our model we had two variables, unemployment and the Fed, both of these variables were in the first differences. So here we have the main matrix with the elements of the matrix and there is an element that is zero. So we're going to talk about now what, what this zero means and what is this identification strategy. So the Fed rate shocks have no contemporaneous effect on unemployment. Unemployment responds with lags to changes in the Fed rate. The explanation for this is nominal rigidity the sticky prices concepts where, for example, when the Fed increases the rate, it's going to take some time for the other macroeconomic variables to, to respond. In this case, unemployment. Also, for example, inflation. If you were working with inflation and the Fed rate increases the rate, inflation is not going to decrease in one period. It's going to take some time to this variable to respond. So this is what we can see here. These two elements correspond for this is unemployment and this will be the effect of unemployment on unemployment and this will be the Fed rate effect on unemployment. So you can see that the Fed rate of unemployment in the short run is going to be zero. This means that the Fed rate shock will have no contemporaneous effect. However, we can see that unemployment shocks have contemporaneous effects on the Fed fund rate. The policymaker has current information of the economy to set the rate. So what we are seeing in here is this line corresponds to the Fed rate. We can see that unemployment does have an effect on the Fed rate and the Fed rate has effect on itself. And the reason for this is because the Fed rate is using this information contemporaneously to react and change the rate. Okay, So for example, there is a shock on unemployment and unemployment increases, the Fed yes, the policymaker can see this uh, and they can change the, the rate to, to see you know if this will have an effect in the in the coming periods. So that's the reason why we are allowing the Fed rate to respond contemporaneously to changes in unemployment. As a tip, the most exogenous variable in your model should go first and then the second most exogenous and so on. The grain share causality test can help you to decide which variables are the most and least exogenous. So again, this is a very particular example that we have in here with unemployment and the Fed. But if you have many other variables and you don't know how to order them, you can help yourself with the grand share causality test. This is going to give you some idea of how you can order the variables. So now that we have talked about the Koleski decomposition and our identification strategy in the model, let's display the impulse response functions. In order to do so, the first thing that you need to do is to set up an IRF active file 
Um, otherwise, this data is going to give you an error when you try to display the impulse response function saying that you don't have an active file. So I'm going to type IRF, set IRF, hit enter, and now we can see that a file has been created called IRF. The next thing that we need to do is to create um, specifically a file that is going to store all the impulse response functions and variance decomposition information. So I'm going to type IRF, then create. Now here you have to assign a name, whatever you wish. I'm going to call it IRF uh, in capital letters, uh, but you can name it whatever you would like. And then I'm going to type comma step 16. This is an option that we are giving to Stata that we are asking to display the information 16 quarters ahead. So remember we are working with quarterly data. So 16 quarters then is going to be four years ahead. Um, so that's basically what I'm asking Stata. If you don't set this, um, Stata might have another um, period or horizon by default, but you can feel free to include any amount of quarters or periods ahead that you would like. We'll hit enter and now we can see that the file has been now updated with this new information. And the last thing that we need to do now is finally to create the graphic. So I'm going to type IRF. Now the command is graph, the impulse response function. And I'm going to type IRF and in parentheses IRF. So I'm telling now to graph the impulse response function from this file that we have created here called IRF. And the next thing that we need to do is to type impulse and we have to tell Stata which are going to be the impulses in our graph. So our impulses are going to be unemployment indifferences and the Fed rate indifferences as well. Um, that's the name of my variables in here, as you can see, that's unemployment and the rate in first differences. And then I have to specify Stata which responses I would like to display. So I would like to display both responses I would like to display the response of unemployment uh, to a shock on unemployment, and then also the response of uh, the response to uh, a shock on the rate. So I'm going to then hit enter, and here Stata has produced the graph. Okay, you can see here the way it displays is impulse response. So here we have the impulse, and this is the response: impulse and response. So I'm going to be talking a little bit more about this in the next slides. So basically this is how we generate the graphic. We can see is the unemployment uh, and the Fed fund rate, impulse response functions, and you can edit then the titles. You can see I, I wrote it, for example, Fed rate shock on the Fed rate. So this is easier for me to identify. So going to the next slide, I'm going to teach you how you have to read and analyze this. So the first thing that you should know is what is the magnitude of the shock, and that's a one standard deviation shock. The gray area in the graph is a standard error confidence band. If these bands are too wide, then what this is gonna tell me is that there is a lot of error. So in this case, they are they are okay. Um, but if you had, for example, a, a gray area that covered the whole graph, then there's a lot of error in your estimation. The x-axis is going to represent the periods quarters ahead. Uh, you can see that we had asked Stata to produce until 16 quarters, so that's why it ends here. Um, and remember, this is quarterly data, okay? Finally, the y-axis is going to show the percentage variation. Uh, this is what you can see in here. This is the percentage variation to, to a shock. And finally, the way that you have to read this is a one standard deviation shock on unemployment has a negative effect on the Fed fund rate. We can see that after one period, the Fed rate is going to decrease up to 1%, and then after the first period, it's going to start going back to the initial values, reaching the zero back after around six, seven quarters. That's what we can see in here. It goes back to the initial values after around seven quarters. So what is the analysis that we can do about this is basically we can see that this is an unemployment shock. This means that unemployment increases and how is the Fed rate going to respond by decreasing the rate? We can see that when unemployment is increasing, the Fed will want to decrease the rate to start to try to activate the economy again. Unemployment is increasing. So by decreasing the rate, we're going to try to impulse the economy again. So that's basically the intuition behind this impulse response function analysis. 
um, is basically how the variables in your model are going to respond to a shock on the rest of the variables in the model. Now let's move into the variance decomposition. The variance decomposition displays the percentage of the error made for casting a variable over time due to a specific shock. So in other words, what we are asking is how much of the variability in the dependent variable is explained by its own shocks versus the shocks in the other variables in the system. Similarly to the impulse response functions, the variance decomposition applies the Kolesky decomposition for identification purposes. So let's go now into Seda and let's display the variance decomposition. The first thing that I would like to display is how an employment changes due to a shock on unemployment and a shock on the Fed rate. In order to do so, I'm going to type IRF. Then I'm going to type table. I don't want the graph like before. Remember, we had produced a graph. For the, imp for the uh, variance decomposition, I would like the table. So again, remember before we were displaying the IRF, in this case, I will type forecast error variance decomposition. Okay, that's, the, that's what you need to type now. We want to create a table for the variance decomposition. And then again, we have to tell from which file. Well, the file is IRF. That's the file that we had created. And we have to tell what are going to be the impulses. So I'm going to type the impulses are going to be unemployment and the rate, and then the response is going to be unemployment. Finally, I'm going to type NOCI, which is telling Stata to not um, include in the table the confidence interval uh, values, because otherwise the table is going to be really big. So I just want to keep the, the responses of unemployment to the shocks of unemployment and the rate. So here we can see that Stata has generated here the variance decomposition. And the first column is going to say one, and here is telling us what that column means. That is going to be, uh, the impulse is going to be unemployment, and this is how the response is going to be unemployment. So this is basically the changes in unemployment due to shocks on unemployment. And then in two, we can see that the impulse is going to be the the Fed rate and the response is unemployment. So this column is going to tell me how are the responses of unemployment to shocks on the rate. We can see that the first period, because of the Koleski decomposition, the first value is going to be zero. Remember that we have imposed in the restriction in the matrix that the first response of unemployment to a shock on the rate is going to be zero. But then we can see that in the coming periods, we are letting the rate to affect unemployment. And we can see that after 16 quarters, 5% of the changes in unemployment will have will be explained, let's say, by the by the uh, Fed rate. And finally, 94% uh, of the variability in unemployment is due to shocks on itself. Finally, you can produce the table again. So I'm going to type quickly the command, IRF table, forecast error variance decomposition, comma, IRF, in parentheses, I type the file. And now I would like to see how does the Fed rate response to changes in unemployment. So I'm going to type the name of my variables in here. And then I want the response to be the Fed rate. I want no confidence intervals, so I type that. And here we can see that Stata has produced the results. We can see that the first column is going to be the response of the Fed rate to shocks on unemployment. And then the second column is going to be the response of the Fed rate to shocks on the Fed rate itself. So basically what we can see is that the Fed rate is responding to, to, to changes in unemployment. We can see that in the quarter 16, up to 20% of the changes in the Fed rate will, will be explained by, by shocks on the unemployment. So this is basically what the variance decomposition information is, is providing us. What is the variability of the dependent variable due to a shock on its own versus the shock on the rest of the variables in the system? Back in the slides here, I have included a table where I have basically provided the information. We have the lags. Here we have the dependent variable, which is unemployment. And these are 
changes in unemployment due to a shock on unemployment and changes in unemployment due to a shock on the Fed rate. Here is similarly the same, changes in the Fed rate due to a shock on unemployment and changes in the Fed rate due to a shock on the Fed rate. Um, and as I mentioned before, we can see that unemployment, changes in unemployment are explained up to 5% by shocks on the Fed rate. And here we can see that changes in the Fed rate are explained up to almost, uh, well, 20%, this is 19%, um, of changes in unemployment. So what's next? Well, the next thing that you will be interested in, in estimating are structural bars. The one that we have covered today is the short-run restrictions, which is the Koleski identification um, strategy. It's a lower triangular matrix. But there are other type of restrictions that you can impose in the in the matrix. You can use then other type of restrictions as long-run restrictions imposed by Blanchard and Qua. Um, or Anderson-Lee 1997 with the concept of money neutrality. Or then you can use sign restrictions, uh, which it was imposed by Oleg. There's a paper in 2005, which you can read, and it's going to provide you some information on how to impose sign restrictions. So this is going to be all for today. I hope that you found this video useful, and it's going to help you to estimate VAR models in Stata, and then to display the impulse response functions and variance decomposition. And I would like to invite you to subscribe to my channel if you like this video, because I'm going to be adding many more tutorials covering different topics as Arch models, Garch models, co-integration, and DSG models in state as well. Once again, thank you very much for watching.